going to get started now. Our next speaker is Rita Randolph. And I'm sure you, she needs no introduction because I've heard her talk on several occasions. She's an awesome speaker. And she comes highly recommended by some, at least a couple of my students. So she comes all the way from Tennessee. And since we didn't see her last night, we didn't know if she would make it here today. Until 8.30, I was really concerned because 8.30 AM, she still was not here. <laughs> and I had not heard from her, no phone calls, no emails. And I thought, oh my god, she must be stuck in some airport. You I know? was on the road. <laughs> Both hands on the wheel. <laughs> no. So she's here today, and I'm so thank I'm, I'm so happy she's here. And as you know, she's a lifelong horticulturist, a photographer, and published author. She wrote the Fine Gardening Container Gardening Special Issue in 2009, which sold out, and, and uh, of course, she published her own book, A History of Horticulture. She owned Rita's, uh, sorry, Randolph's greenhouses for 35 years started by her parents almost 70 years ago. That's a very famous greenhouse, if you, if you have not heard about it. She now spends most of her time consulting, writing, and traveling. Her, presentation, uh, her presentations are enjoyed across the country as she enthusiastically shares her knowledge and creative arrangements. She's very good with plants. You'll get a feel for that once she's done with her talk. Thank you. She has presented to botanical gardens, horticultural societies, and conferences for many years, and was recently presented the Sterling Award as one of the top 20 influential women in, in West Tennessee for her educational works. Today, she's going to talk about four seasons of containers, containerscaping, and according to the U.S. Census, 42% of American families are dual-income families, and 29% are single parents with children who have little or no time for, you know, for um, traditional gardening. So this is going to be a very interesting talk for most families because they have, you know, they have no time to go outdoors and start, fam and start gardening. So Rita is going to take it away now, and she is going to, I think I have a little more, uh, yeah, she'll be, she'll be doing a hands-on workshop tomorrow as well. So if you have not signed up, please go online and sign up ASAP. We also have a sign-up sheet in front if you're interested, and uh, there's a small fee for that. So just make sure you address, you, your payment is made by checks. Please make sure the checks are made out to JCCC, okay? Thank you, Rita. For Thank you. Here. Hi, y'all. I, I got your picture earlier for Facebook, so I'm sticking it up there. Um, I grow everything. Nothing sacred, so there's everything in there for the tender, annual, tropical lover in the woody, if you just wait around long enough. So, um, Anyway, I'd like to dedicate this to my son, who just got back. <laughs> Okay, enough, enough about him. Okay, our place is old. Um, my parents started at World War II. This is sort of what it looked like in the 50s. And what I wanted to show you is uh, shopping techniques have not changed. Is this a laser? Oh, it is. Okay, see these women right there? Okay, three of them are walking down the road. One of them's still struggling to get out of the car. <laughs> wait, wait, I'm coming with you. No, you got the good stuff first. The last time, I'll see you down there. So. Anyway, we started out right across the road from a runway of an airport. <laughs> runway of an airport. And so if you were standing in my parking lot, this flew over, literally. <laughs> so they took the aerial rights from 12 feet to 6 feet over our house. We sued. We won $20,000, which was a lot of money back then. It wasn't enough for us to move, but it was enough to finance the move. So we moved up to the other end of the property and started. Randolph's greenhouses that, um, it, you can Google it anyway. I did go to school at New York Botanic Garden because I thought I needed some education. And at the very beginning of this conference, I wanted to say they were talking about this being one of the top five um, horticultural community colleges, and I do believe that. I went to one of them when I was a teenager. For all you high school guys out here, I, I went to Clackamas Community College out in the Northwest. It's in Portland. But back then, they didn't have horticulture. They had ag. And they took us all out to packing houses to weed out the 101ers. <laughs> Weeded me right out. I've been a vegetarian ever since. So, um, thank you. Thank you. But anyway, I did go to New York Tent Garden and study a little bit. And I'm very good friends with Alan Armitage at the University of Georgia. And he hired me last year for a couple of months before he retired to sort of funk up the garden. And this is his friend, Coach Dooley. Now, Coach Dooley has a hydrangea named after him, and he is an excellent gardener, but he's very much a Woody's guy. He's got some flowers and perennials around. But this is his yard right here. 
And at any one time, somebody will just drive in his driveway and bring him a rare tree or shrub. And he's not going to go dig a hole and put it in the ground. So he puts it in containers. And then he'll move them around his patio. And I've been to dinner parties at his place. And he'll use the containers as room dividers on the patio. So you might go back into this little secret area. And then you might have this open area over here. So container gardening is not just for not having to weed your garden anymore. Container gardening fits so many different people's lifestyles now. Now, this is my um, van on any given day. <laughs> and if you go out in the parking lot, you see it. it's the one with 350,000 miles on it, a lot of rust on the front, and it's plastered all across the back with bumper stickers. So if anybody ever wants to get me anything, I collect good bumper stickers. Not any old bumper sticker, but good ones. But anyway. So over here, I did. Um, I speak at OFA and travel around a whole lot. And so I have some friends up in the uh, Pennsylvania area at Peace Tree Farms. And I'm in Perennial Plant Association. Have y'all heard of that in Garden Writers? Okay, Perennial Plant's great. So is Garden Writers. But Perennial Plant was meeting in Philadelphia. And Lloyd and I were in Columbus, Ohio. And he says, Rita, come home with me and help me do all the containers for Perennial Plant. You're coming anyway. I said, OK. So. A lot of people brought us these containers, and then a lot of nurseries and garden centers and other people brought us a bunch of plants, and it was my job to organize that, put them together. I did over 125 large container gardens in two days. So I lined them all up down the greenhouse, and I'd throw in the major players, and then I had some people helping me that would do the stuff around the sides, and then we had the finishers that did all the trailing stuff, and it was a lot of fun. But um, somebody said, where's Rita? I can't find her. And if I was, they said, oh, I'm sorry, I smoke a cigarette every now and then. So I went outside, and they go, oh, she's having a cigarette. No, I was picking up rocks. See the top of this pot right here? I went and got some nice little short, you know, grassy-like little ground covers and some stone because I didn't want to put anything in that pot to compete with the line and structure of that tree. So sometimes you have to let the plants talk to you to see who wants to go in that pot. Or, you know, you can walk around with a plant and find the right pot, but you can also find a beautiful pot that you love. Like, who, who doesn't love a blue pot, you know? And you can walk around with it and see who wants to go in. But anyway, this is me working. You know, um, there was a couple of people standing around in their khakis with their cell phones and their Velcro pruners like this. And I mean, they were pristinely white, clean. I said, leave, you're in the way. Get out of here. So this is me up to my elbows. But isn't that sweet? Look, black mondo, a little bit of maybe selaginella, I'm not really sure, and then some little stones around it right there. Anyway, I do write for a lot of uh, publications, um, GM Pro, Greenhouse Garden, and I'm a regular writer for the States Magazine. But I had to speak up at Longwood one time, and this cert I've, I've spoken there twice, but they, this one conference they had, they only wanted published authors. And I thought, well, I did the Fine Gardening magazine. They went, no, we mean a book. You have to have a book. Oh. <laughs> so I wrote this one. <laughs> what happened was I was asked to speak at uh, International Plant Propagators in Louisville, Kentucky, a couple of years, well, three years ago. And I was just a shoe in for somebody that couldn't go. And I thought, what can I tell these international plant propagators that know everything and have degrees and they're professors? What can I tell them that they don't already know? They don't want to hear about container gardening. So our place is so old, I predate plastic. <laughs> so I thought, they might want to hear that story. So in case y'all haven't heard it, I know a lot of these other people have. For the high school students, the way we used to grow was in the ground in sandy beds. We dug up flowers with a trowel. A lady might come to shop and she had on a nice little pillbox hat and high heel shoes and she says, well, I want that one and I want that one. And my mother would get down on her knees or one of our employees would get down on her knees, dig it up, wrap it in newspaper and put it in wooden boxes for you to take home. That's how things were grown. Then when we thought we could afford containers, we got clay pots. Our first poinsettias came from California on a train in clay pots. So when we got the clay pots, you would come to our place and you would shop. And I don't care if it was an azalea or a geranium or whatever. You would come up to the checkout. We would tap out the plant. You didn't get the clay pots. Tap it out, stack up the pot, wrap it up in newspaper, put it in a wooden box. And then we got into cardboard and peat packs and plastic pots and 
And my father would throw us in the dumpster to get out cardboard boxes so that we didn't have to have uh, wooden boxes. So I've seen, a, I may not look that old, but I've seen the, the business change quite a bit. And I'm real excited for you guys because they didn't have horticulture schools like that I could go to when I was younger. Anyway, the other neat thing about me is I had my own plant introduction, which was a total accident. I found this fern years ago, back in the 70s, and I thought it was great. Chartreuse plants were not cool then. There weren't even any chartreuse hostas back in the 70s, not that hit the market anyway. So it disappeared, fell off the face of the earth, and then I found it again about 15 years ago. And Alan Armitage was at a trade show, and a friend of mine held it up and said, what do you think of this? And he went, yuck, yuck, and kept walking. And he went, wait a minute, turn around, came back and said, let me see that thing. So he took it to the University of Georgia, gave it Classic City, and named it after me. And I've got some friends who were going like, how do you get a plant named after you? You know, it was, I cried. When I went to, he got it into tissue culture for me, he spoke up for me, and when I went to AgriStarts and I saw thousands of them with my name on it, I just cried like a baby. So I hope that gets to happen to you sometime. It was really fun. But a lot of new plants are not bred. They are found. There's plenty of breeding going on, but keep your eyes open for the unusual. It may be a virus. <laughs> so, it may not, you know. So anyway, okay, containers. I surround my home. I'm sorry the color's a little bit off, but anyway, you get the gist. I, I plant containers everywhere. I live at my place, and I surrounded my place with them and made sure that people could walk around the garden and be uh, in, you know, invigorated and have a good time and come picnic and bring the kids. And I even had a big front lawn where I would let them picnic if they wanted to. Right up here, there's a nice little lady. You're going to see her next. When you have little bitty containers, it's like, what do I get that will actually thrive in a small container? This is a plant that everybody should know. Because it's a vine, it'll run down long, it'll run up, or you can keep it clipped and it just bouquets out. It's real pretty. It's a Solanum jasminoides. I didn't bring a handout. If you email me at the end, I have my contact information. I can send you, but the problem is I tweaked my slides to the very minute so the handout wouldn't follow it anyway. Solanum jasminoides or jasmine potato vine. It doesn't smell, but it is certainly darling, and it will grow in a hole this big. So. Also love annual moon vines and all sorts of plants, and don't plant them on the back 40. Plant them where you're going to sit at night and enjoy them. You know, if you're going to go hide the dog fence, you can't smell them. This is on my patio, I mean on my deck, and as soon as dusk arrives, about 5 o'clock, they start opening up. And then you get those wonderful hawk moths that come, and right across the way are the brugmansias, another great container plant. I know it's a bug magnet, but it's one of the few bug magnets worth growing. It really is a great plant. And uh, those things open up about 5 or 6 o'clock, right where you're sitting, and the scent immediately drifts down, and you forget everything you were talking about. It's like, oh my god. Really wonderful. This is what our greenhouses used to look like. I had 10 greenhouses, and I grew everything in the back houses, and I had a retail garden center that I built right up front for organization. Because what I found out is when you have a whole lot of plants like this, it can be very intimidating for the customer who just wants to come in and shop and buy some cool plants or nice plants. <coughs> Lady walked in, and she, you know, one of my girls said, can I help you? And she goes, oh, I'm going to go look. You know, well. She came back through and she said, can I help you now? And she goes, no, I thought I knew what I wanted till I got here. <laughs> well, this girl that worked for me was from the north. No offense any of you northerners, but you got a different sense of uh, humor than we do. She goes, well, maybe you need to go home and think about it. <laughs> I wasn't there to hear it, but one of my other employees says, you need to hear what Marilyn said. I said, okay, employee meeting right now. Right now. Don't ever say that. Show me one thing you liked. Show, just show me one plant that you liked that stood out. Just one. I can show you two or three or four. We don't want to intimidate them now, but I can show you their friends. So what we did was we organized the tables, which you don't see is 14 different color theory tables from the color wheel to feng shui. You know, and what I did was a pink table, a citrus table, a white table, a metallic table, a watercolor table. And watercolor was feng shui. It wasn't watercolor pastels. It was the colors that float on water. Blue, black, gray, green, silver. 
just beautiful. And he put metallic balls on there and stuff like that. By organizing the tables in color theory and also in the heights of the plants, the big guys in the middle, the fillers you know, in front of them, and then the spillers on the edge, people knew how to shop. We helped them shop. And all they had to do was carry around their pot and match the plants to go with them. And that's how you sell a lot of weird plants. You have to show them how to use them or at least instill some ideas. OK, I'm going to give you a few of my basics before I get into real containers. We mix our own dirt. Now, I know it's potting media, OK? So if I say dirt, this is going to be interchangeable here for a little while. Basically, five things. My husband and I argue about it all the time, so get ready. Down at the bottom is a barky mix, like what you plant perennials and shrubs in, a bark base mix, 60% bark. Other pot, peat base mix, like what you put bedding plants and tender things in. <laughs> And we're trying to get away from peat moss, but until we find a good substitute and core becomes more affordable, we're stuck with peat moss for a little bit longer. So peat, bark, the black gold is compost. Maybe even with a little topsoil in there, mushroom compost, worm castings, whatever, compost. So we have peat, bark, compost, sand, and perlite. And for a medium-sized plant, those are pretty much all even parts, and you get what's in the middle right there. I have two pots of, well, let me back up. If you have tender plants, you'll go heavier on the peat, lighter on everything else. If you have woodies and perennials that you're doing a big commercial installation, this is pretty much good to go. Over there, I've got two pots of gravel because the other plants that I really love are conifers and succulents, and you're going to see them in a minute. And they love my rich compost-based soil, but they like excellent drainage and also top dress with them. So inert gravel, that's volcanic uh, rock, which is vol block, and some washed pea gravel. Another really good trick, making your customers successful when they go home. Once the plants leave, like I don't have a guarantee on my plants, I guarantee them to be the healthiest thing they are when they walk out that door. Dog could pee on them, you could go shopping at Walmart, leave them closed up in 100 degree heat. I'm sorry, I don't guarantee that. But what I do is I help them be successful and I address their problems. They dry out too much or they freeze, you know, in a pot or the pot breaks. Now, I'll address these problems. Bubble wrap for winter and summer, extreme temperatures. In the winter, the bubble wrap in a zone seven or six keeps your pot from breaking because it allows for all the expansion of the soil when it freezes. And in the summertime, it's great because it allows for insulation in a 98 or 100 degree sunny day. An example, a lady came to my place and wanted a pot. She pointed to that blue one over there and I went to pick it up. It burned my hands. It's out in the sun. It burned my hands when I touched it. You've sat on a hot iron chair in the sun. You know what it feels like. What is that doing to the root system of the plant? So Bubble wrap is a really good insulator. We used to use styrofoam board, you know, from packing materials just so we could recycle them and not throw them in the dump. The other thing is terracotta dries plants out. Terracotta and concrete wick the moisture out of your pots. You can water it. You'd be watering it two or three times a day on a hot sunny day in the south, especially when they're root bound and the roots are in contact. So this, you know, really expensive Italian clay pot is pretty much worthless to me in a sunny situation unless I line it with plastic. So we put some gravel or, you know, bricks or something in the bottom of the pot, put plastic in it, poke holes in it, a little bit more gravel, just so water doesn't sit in the bottom of that pot, and then plant it and then tuck the plastic in there, and then after you top dress it, you don't even know it's there. So it's just like a liner instead of in, inside a pot. Also, if you're going to do a container garden service, we carry these Acro Mills pots. They're really cheap. That's what you got for the workshop tomorrow? Yeah. We carry them in every size. And people would say, oh, Rita, I'd love for you to do my pots, but they're just too heavy. I can't bring these things to you. And I don't go to anyone's house. You know, they got to bring them to me. I do now, but anyway, didn't back then. So they can take a liner home out on approval, see which one fits, call me. I plant the liner, and then they come pick them up when they're ready. So that's how we do that. And also that plastic liner provides insulation for that concrete pot. It also creates an airspace in between ceramic pots so you've got a little air buffer there so that when the sun's shining on it on a pool deck, it won't cook it. The other thing that's really important, 
and you can get away with it, but it's nice to have his pot feet. And they don't have to be these fancy little pot feet. Bricks will do, rocks will do. Something to keep that pot up off the ground because if it's on a, you know, a paved surface, it's not that bad, but the direct contact with a hot surface is a little bad. And also, if you're putting a pot on the ground, water can seize up. It, as, it, as the pot drains, it creates a little mud hole and plugs the hole. You'll go buy a pot and it's wilted, you water it, and you go back a little hour or two later, it's still wilted, water it again, and it overflows because the pot stopped up. So just teaching you things that you can look for to um, prevent. Okay, I have two rules of container garden combination. Foliage first. Foliage first. Flowers are a bonus. What happens if you forget to fertilize or you have to deadhead? You ain't got no flowers. So make sure your foliage looks good and what better way to show you than green. Also, rule number two, okay, foliage first. <clears throat> rule number two, break up your large leaves with fine foliage. You can have the most gorgeous foliage in the world like acolyphus, copper plants, hosta, anything. Begon Rex begonias, you can have all these wonderful foliages and you put them together and it looks like you dumped out a gorgeous puzzle but hadn't put it together yet. Fine foliage is the glue, the caulk, whatever that makes all those big leaves go together and you don't have to do dit dot, big leaf, fine foliage, dit dot, fine foliage. You just have to have them within the same eye view of each other just like they juxtapose this. You have big leaves at the bottom, the fine foliage at the top. So what I did when I started doing containers like hanging basket mixes, I got my foliage first. I got the lotus and the variegated potato vine right there. And then I went for flowers. I wanted to make sure I had enough foliage in that hanging basket to look good even if it wasn't in bloom. So that way I started with the flowers. This way I started with the pot. I love this green pot. It's one of those green, heavy ceramic wave pots. I took the pot shop, shopping right there. And I, you're going to see some wild, gaudy combinations, but I like monochromatic, cool, calm ones too because they have different uses. These calm ones go where you're going to sit and read a book, where you're going to be quiet and relax. That gaudy color can be out front or on the pool deck or on the patio where it can show from the road. I don't care, but those are high energy areas. I also do all of my vegetable gardening in containers and I used my compost-based mix, and I used organic fertilizer. I like a Spoma. I like organic mechanic. I like a lot of them, but you want to make sure that you don't get out the blue and green stuff too much. You can use it a little bit, and it better have a tomato on the front, but not too much. Uh, I really like to grow them a little bit lean, and I'll get to that in just a minute. We all know how pretty chard can be, and I put lots of chard and lettuce and kale into my early containers because I get two sales. I sell the pot with the lettuce and the kale and the cabbage. Then when they've eaten it all or it gets hot and it poops out, they bring the pot back and have flowers put in. So you have two things going on there. Also, when you're doing vegetables, do a little bit of research over how big they get before they fruit. There's some dwarf vegetables. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. It's going to get six feet tall and what are you going to do with it now? There's a lot of German varieties that are cold uh, weather tomatoes or European varieties that are determinate and they're shorter. They're even doing dwarf eggplant now. And eggplant is gorgeous. The flowers are blue. The foliage is silver. So there's lots of reasons to grow uh, vegetables in containers too. But this is not a staged photograph. This is what I do. But by planting with a compost-based mix, and using Espoma or your choice of organic fertilizer and compost in the soil, you can actually get the right proportion of fruit, flowers, and foliage. If you get out the blue and green stuff, you're just going to have a lot of fluff and not the proportion of fruit and flowers. This is a photo shoot I did for Bonnie Plant Form years ago where I actually had to grow the plants and prove to them that this is doable. This is a 10-inch hanging basket of tumbling tom I planted in early May. This is in September. So it can be done, but don't apply too much uh, ammonium fertilizer to it or it'll, it'll just outgrow the pot. You won't have any fruit. Okay, over here are herbs that I do in these little troughs for my brother. My brother is a 
right across the road, and he had a motorcycle wreck. One leg, one leg is like two inches shorter than the other. So he lives in a trailer, and he built this big shop. He's a professional um, um, hydraulics mechanic at the Department of Transportation. So he's going out his trailer, and he goes down the steps like this, because one leg's shorter than the other. Then he walks over to his shop, and then he goes up the steps like this. So he got this bright idea to build a deck all one level from his trailer to his shop. I said, oh, Paul, when you get through with your deck, I'd love to do your containers for you. He said, well, Rita, I'm not a flowery kind of guy. <laughs> you know, he's a mechanic, but if you turn around and bend over, you'd swear he's a plumber. So <laughs> anyway, this is his lovely deck that connects his trailer to his uh, shop. These are those troughs that I do. This trough right here is right there. Just a few months later. Same container. Oh, those are pepper trees. Aren't they cute? They have peppers hanging on them. So he grills. He does that bar food, you know, like pickled vegetables and sauces and stuff like that. So he, he has a big garden. But anyway, that's his patio. Ornamental edibles can come in very large fashion, too. This is at Chicago Botanic Garden, and I was just entranced by that. I walked up to it, and I'm going, oh, man, this is so cool. I didn't realize I was in a handicap garden. Now, I broke my ankle a few years ago in March, right before the busy season, and I had to spend spring in a wheelchair. If you build a place, make it accessible to the handicap because you may need it yourself one day. I'm serious. I never thought about it. You know, you think wheelchairs are for old people or retarded people or something. No. I fell down my deck stairs, broke my ankle, and had to work. And if you have ever tried to garden in a wheelchair, I, you ought to just park yourself in a wheelchair for one day just to see what these people have to do with. This was a, a handicapped garden, and I didn't know it until right as I'm awestruck taking pictures, the automatic gate comes open and a lady comes in in her wheelchair just fabulous. These are just two by fours on their side, sandwiched with chicken wire and moss with some compost mixed dirt put in there. And they grow them flat for about, you know, a few weeks. And then they hang them up. That was fabulous. Okay. If you do tabletop pots, make sure the plants stay short. <laughs> Nothing worse than going to a party where you did the pots and they got moved off on the from the table onto the floor because they couldn't talk. You know, make sure, anyway. Cute little thing. Common little plant like Moses in the boat. Try to scan it. There's also some new caladiums coming out that are really small, like for tabletop pots. These are called the Thai caladiums, and they're available at AgriStarts. You may be able to find them at Brent and Becky's or some other places. I know y'all know caladiums, but this is Humboldtai. Two inch leaves. Six inches tall. Fifty leaves on a six inch pot. You know, it takes a year to grow, but anyway, four inch pot would be like teacup mug size. But this one, I had never seen a chartreuse caladium with red veins before. Oh, I have to have it. And my customers come in the door and they feel the same way. I've got to have it. And this spring, I'm working at a garden center in my own hometown and they're going, are you gonna have those Thai caladium? Oh, they're fabulous. Now, the names are really hard to get through. Just pick them out from the pictures. This is Pudon Pink. Sounds like a province in China. We call it Pudon Pink. Anyway, okay. When you plant containers for people, ask them what they're going to use it for. This was a centerpiece for a garden club. Then it's going out on our shady patio. And you know, I talked to you about a mixed mound dirt. Oh, it's potting media. No, when it dribbles over the edge, and hangs down the pot, that's when it's dirt. When it's in the pot, it's potting media. I top dress everything. If not with short, small plants, I put gravel on there, I put bark on there, I put glass on there, marbles, driftwood, anything to cover up the dirt because that's what people see. They don't know how expensive it is. You know, it's, anyway, so. Lots of times I make these on a lazy Susan and actually turn them around, make sure that I can't see dirt anywhere because I don't want to sit at the table and be the one that made the pot and see dirt. But these are just some of the plants that you can use as under planting, even in a sunny pot. Okay, I love it. Y'all are the sun shining on me. Yes, all of this needs to be sun. But right here, we got a little microclimate in back. 
It's called shade. It's called shade. So even back here, when the west sun goes over, if these are two pots sitting at somebody's front walk, when she walks out, you didn't put a shady plant in the back. She's looking at dirt. No, her company is looking at dirt. You know, that's what really gets us. Top dress, if not with plants, something, even a small pot. Small plants in a big pot. You wouldn't think it would work, right? Small plants in a big pot. You wouldn't think it would work. Think puzzle pieces in color. Hold your plants together and see who likes each other and who wants to go together. Everybody loves these heads, and um, these are both Xeric. You know, one's dry, one's wet. Xeric's just an extreme. It can be wet or dry. So this is Eleocharis, the siculator, toe tickler grass, and then, of course, she's Simpervivens and Stippa nacella, whatever it's called now. And this lady comes in, she goes, oh, I don't know which one to get. I love them both, so I turned one, like she's whispering sweet nothings into the other one's ear, and she says, oh, I have to have them both. I said, yes. <laughs> yes, you do. But you can just get one dollar up a little bit. Now, I usually wear these chain things on my glasses, you know, so I can just hang them around my neck. And so they break occasionally. So that's what all these are. This lady brought this up to the checkout. And, she, and the first thing I did, went, oh, you're buying the, the lady. Yes, I love her. She's so elegant. So I just snatched those right off. And she goes, those don't come with it. I said, no, do you get some pearls at home? <laughs> Maybe southern, but I can say faux bois. Isn't that nice? No flowers. Don't have to have flowers. But I like shrimps. They put up with hot, hot sun. And I love mixing shrubs and things in with my containers, too. Don't be restrained by saying they have to be annuals, or they have to be perennials, or they have to be shrubs. You, know, you can walk around and mix them up together. Croton, tango from seed. Y'all know about the impatience problems we're having with the blight. New guineas are where it's at now. I grow very few regular impatience. Oxalis vulcanicola, creeping jenny, my little fern. These are the paradise series of impatience from Eki Ranch over in California. They actually have the coordinating variegated foliage with the color of the flower. I love it. They're so pretty. Mother-in-law's tongue. It's really making a comeback. I am so glad. I have about eight or nine kinds. Y'all aren't impressed with mother-in-law's tongue. You got one somewhere, don't you? Can't kill it. Can't give it away. It's just like a mother-in-law. <laughs> just needs friends. Most mother-in-laws do. So put some friends in there with her. Isn't that pretty? Not a single flower. Not a single flower. Well, dwarf mother-in-law. Yeah, you can put flowers in there if you want to. I'm just not going to. But this is a piece of Ozark Mountain pottery that I did. Um, and if you put something in there, it's going to cover it all up. No one's going to see the pottery. So this is Senecio. This thing is virtually indestructible. You could do it like a bungee cord and it wouldn't break. It's really easy. Senecio. Terrariums are really coming in, and I like to do a uh, mist bottle with them. I, whenever I do a terrarium, I don't tell them to pour water in there. I say, get a mist bottle, but don't mist them. Open up the cock to where you're shooting that plant and shoot it. Always have gravel down at the very bottom, and when you get through shooting these plants, when you see one or two drops coming down to the bottom, stop. Don't water it anymore. Unless you want a water container. This is a little piece of papyrus. And you can actually pour water in that thing. So aquatic terrariums are really cool, too. This is a group of terrariums at the Biltmore. I thought were really nice. I love the Biltmore. I contract grew for them for a long time, the Biltmore collection. Anything is a container. Anything. That scene wouldn't be near as interesting without that bird case. Dichondra silver falls is this nice carpet. Covers the soil and hangs down the pot. Just because you have a big wall, you have a client that needs something to cover up that wall. Don't get a big plant. Hang something on the wall. And I do a talk called Outdoor Rooms where I show a lot of lattice work and, and items hanging on the walls, but that's another day. I hang some tires on the wall. Isn't that cute? Anything is a container. These are my friends of Saul's. 
This is at a garden center. Nice little display. Okay, hanging basket. We have a thing at our place called the ugliest basket contest. And I won. I love this. I did it and I won. But you can't kill a spider plant. This is an easy plant for somebody to grow. But by itself, it's a little boring. It just needs some friends to put in there. And as I said, I'm not growing very many of the impatient from seed anymore because we're having so many blight problems with it. But monoculture, okay, if you have a hanging basket of just one flower, I may say it's boring, but it's where it's at is why it's boring. If you've got a lot of lattice work and benches and pergola and stuff and a lot of things going on, monoculture or one color flower is probably a good thing to do. It gives your, your eyes a place to rest. But if you're only going to have two hanging baskets out front and nothing else, monoculture is a little boring to me. I'd like to do a little showier thing. One fern and three vinca vine. I know vinca vine can be invasive in some places, but in a hanging basket, we know what it's going to do. Three feet long and a tropical look. You know, so it's real cheap, easy fit. Mandevillas come in on a trellis. Yeah, you knew that, didn't you? You know why? To fit on the rack, to fit in the truck, to fit in the greenhouse. Yes, it's a vine, but what vines do is they grow up to reach the light, and then the sun shines on it, they finally bloom up there. We found out if you turn vines loose, like they've already reached the top and they're hanging over, sun shines on the stems, you get a lot more blooms a lot quicker. When I get in mandevillas or diplodanias, I take them off the trellis and put them in hanging baskets, and they start blooming immediately when the sun shines on those buds. Great for a sunny spot around a pool. This client gets these every single year. But one thing I think our industry is very, very slow on is coming up with a lightweight hanging container in a large size. It's either plastic or cocoa, right? This is at Dallas Arboretum, and my friend Jimmy Turner is about six and a half feet tall and 300 pounds. He's not there anymore. He went to Sydney, Australia to work. He actually picked up this ceramic bowl this big, full of dirt, full of plants, and made a chain macrame hanger because he wanted a big hanging thing. So I think we need to get on our suppliers to produce some lightweight hanging large containers. Think of resin and rubber and everything else for a patio. Why can't they do some hanging stuff? Just a little idea for uh, focal points. Not a lot going on there, a little red, white, and blue. These are just rubber plants. I think the customer probably went to, you know, like a Home Depot or something and got some rubber plants and put some coleus around it. But I thought it was very effective. Nice and calming as you're walking around the back side of the house. <laughs> just giving you some ideas. I was trying to see how many chartreuse plants I could get in one pot. <laughs> but what I want you to look at is right here. Fiber optic. And I brought this grass, this is your gift by the way, but I brought it in to show you because I'm getting ready to talk about grasses and grass-like plants. I'll give it to you in a minute. This is a brand new one you're going to see in a minute. But when fiber optic and these carex and fescues and grass-like plants like that, when they grow in the ground, the needles hit the ground, the tips die, and then it quits growing and more comes out and pours on top of it. That's just how they grow. When the tips touch the ground, the tip dies and quits growing. I found when you hang them out of containers, they don't stop growing. I can get fiber optic in these Carex to get three and four feet long, simply hanging out of a container. So we're looking at more of a cascading element instead of another plant. This has got fescue coming out the back. This all started with that terrenia. This whole container started with that terrenia with a purple throat. I walked around with it. I found the mica oxalis and the strobilanthes. And then I said, ooh, that's too dark. And I started going with chartreuse to match the yellow. Walk around with your plant. It's just like picking out a scarf to go with your new jacket or dress or picking out a tie. It's that easy. You don't have to match. You need complement or contrast. Just some interesting caladiums and things you can find. This is a first year Thai giant and Siam Ruby were available and I had to have them and I just threw them all in one pot. I knew they'd get big. This was my favorite pot about two years ago. And it does have flowers in it. I don't hate flowers. I just don't depend on them. <coughs> That's pretty daggum gaudy, isn't it? I mean, I, you know, when you get 
get a little older like my mom did, you know, the clothes start getting a little gaudier and the shiny shoes come out. And I, thought, <laughs> I thought I'm doing stuff like this now. God knows what I'm going to be doing when I get old. Oof. But I like plain, simple stuff too. It's all in where it needs to go. I did not like this pot till I put that junkus in there. It was just a mixed lantana pot. Boring. Stuck that junkus in there, and it just looks like a little explosion going on. Papyrus, it's a wonderful plant. It's putting a bucket without a drain hole in the middle of a bigger pot. That's how you do that. You want something big? Papyrus is great. Put it in a bucket with gravel. Fill it up with water. Put it in the middle of a bigger barrel. This is cassia candlestick tree. You know, cannas and things like that. I love papyrus. I could talk all day about papyrus. Architectural form. No other plant could have held up to these conditions of walking around that cold corner, except, except for maybe a mother-in-law's time, because it goes straight up too. But. This is a little papyrus from down at Saul's Nursery in Atlanta. It's Saul's. It only gets 10 inches, and it likes shade. So I put it in there with my toe tickler grass. This is a pot that you could grow right here on the podium with some fluorescent light. Doesn't have a drain hole. It's not going to pee on the computer. You go away for a week and come back from vacation, it's still alive because it's full of water. Easy. This is another way I use toe tickler. And we found out this is zone six. It'll disappear in the winter, but it'll come back up. It's an aquatic plant. And this is how I use it, off center. Like right here is a great place for like a little orb, a little ball, a little fairy. And I did a pot for a guy one time, and I put a golf tee in there in a little hole. So it's, it's a lot of fun to play with. But these are some of the grasses and grass-like plants that can hang off the side of the pot. Carex and juncus and fescues and things like that. This is the one I brought today, so this is your present. This is Everio. Everio spelled like Hispanic spell, Ever, Everio, two L's at the end. This just came out last year, and it's from Pacific Plug and Liner, and it is chartreuse. If you've ever grown Evergold Carex, this is like Evergold on steroids. It's a tetraploid. It does not produce seed, so it puts all that energy into growing. And since I'm in Garden Riders, I got all the first early samples. And what I wanted to show you is, are y'all familiar with Bowles Golden Carex at all? Okay, it's a, it likes water. It's nice. It comes up, but the first wind breaks the foliage. This is Bowles Golden right here. And I'm sorry the color's a little off, but it, it breaks real easy. It'll flop on you, and we've learned to love it anyway. It's just its fault. These two are the same age. So there's ever Rio versus Bowles Golden. Can't say enough wonderful things about it. It's a great plant. See all the little foliage, roof iris, box honeysuckle stuff. I'm a foliage nut. That's one way you can use them. Fescue with begonias. Wandering Jew and mother-in-law's tongue. How common can you get? But what I wanted to show you is right here, fescue. This pot is like 14 to 16 inches tall, and it is this long. It's almost touching the floor. I know, would not cute? This is a perfect plant, perfect pot. That's just all you have to say. But look at the fiber optic hanging out from underneath that Sambuca. Isn't that nice? And I didn't like this pot either until I put that Carex in there. That's Carex testaceae or orange hair sedge. It's just got a coppery glow, like a good red-headed girl, you know. It's just got that nice hair thing going on. If you need big grasses, the princess grasses are nice. I'm going to fly through them. But this is five plants in a pot. Now, princess gets big. It's big. Also, vertigo is a really good one. But all it has is a potato vine, a zinnia or two, and a coleus. Don't look at the lobelia in there. Somebody else put that in there. I don't know. <laughs> I like to look at containers as art forms instead of just filling up a pot full of flowers. And by the way, whoever's got the succulent booth out there is right on. I just love those. I'm going by there before I leave. Nice, nice stuff. These are uh, the new Penicetum, the annual types, fireworks, and skyrocket. Now, as much as this looks white and cool as a cucumber, that is a full sun variegated grass. Skyrocket Penicetum. 
I use grasses a lot in my containers, and uh, I look on them like, remember I was talking about room dividers? And I'm going to fly in a minute. But. Okay, say y'all are this, at the swimming pool, and this is the sitting area on the deck. Now, bring the kids over, bring the grandkids over, and let's, let's let them swim, and we'll visit, right? No. What do they do? Mommy, mommy, watch this. Granny, watch this. Five times. Watch this. Put a little room divider there. They can go swimming. You're there. They know you're there. You're out of sight, but not out of mind. And if they're drowning, you can go save them. <laughs> but given that little bitty thin room divider is going to give you just a little bit of privacy, just a little bit of space. Nice big containers, Dallas Arboretum. This is at Atlanta Botanic Garden. This is color theory, y'all. This is when I say color belongs, you know, with the area's use, like show from the road, loud, gaudy, bright, primary colors. This was when Atlanta had that hundred and something degree drought and it was the hottest place in the universe. I was there at Atlanta Botanic Garden. I was about to die. I was in the children's garden and there's red and orange and yellow and all this stuff going on and I'm so I gotta get out of here. And as I walk across the bridge to go back, I see this and my temperature mentally came down 10 degrees just by looking at it. So cool as a cucumber colors, whites, chartreuse, pastels, quieter places. A wintertime pot with uh, Panicum Northwind, Pyracantha, Carex, and Hucus. And I didn't get into conifers until I was older. My dad taught me how to grow them, and he died when I was a teenager, and so we didn't really have a great relationship. He would have me rooting cuttings and grafting as a teenager, and I hated it because I thought, I'm going to be dead and gone before these plants reach maturity. I had no patience whatsoever. But now these cute little ones that everybody's growing, you just use them in a small pot, then you can put them in a bigger pot, and by three or four years, you got a berm in the ground, you know. Cute little thing where you can put some fairy furniture. This one stayed on my deck for three years before it got too big, and I put it in a bird bath, big bird bath, and then it went to the ground. So you don't have to pot it all. You just arrange it. <coughs> and sometimes just one plant is all you need. I just want to go hug that. That's chubby. I love chubby. <laughs> I called my son chubby when he was little. Mama calls me chubby. Have y'all heard that joke? I'll get away from that. <laughs> I love yuccas, cactus, succulents. Mix the gravel in with the soil and then top dress too. Now this one was taken years ago. This is a little 10 inch thing. This big. When aeoniums first came out. We didn't have any suppliers. I bought it at Home Depot or Lowe's. And I had heard that they were hard to propagate. You can't do a long stem cutting. You just cut the little head off, you know, root it. But while I was figuring all that out, I just thought I'd, it looked like a purple palm tree. So I put it in there, and I put some ogon under it, and I got me a little island. It's mine. My husband calls me and says, how much is the Aeonium palm tree? I said, it's mine. Rita, you can't do this. You have to put a price on it. You're going to, excuse me, piss people off. Why can I not have my own plants, you know? <laughs> okay, it was like 65 or 85 bucks. He said, just put a high price on it and they won't buy it. So I did, and they bought it. <laughs> it's funny what some people would rather have than money. I would rather have my plant back, you know, but anyway, I grew another one. Seed a maker in a container has not been watered, touched, fertilized, or well, it's been looked at, but in five years. Tony Avent's got it bad too. This is his place. I love Tony. Hen and chicks, get it. Hen and chicks. These are hen and chicks too. This is called cobwebs. These are little big guys. Isn't that nice? Homemade hypertufa. This is at uh, Chanticleer. If you ever get to go to Philadelphia, I spend a lot, my best friend lives up there, go to Chanticleer. It is the smallest botanic garden, I think anywhere. And it's my favorite of any of them that I've ever been to. And this is out in the Pacific Northwest. This, I hate to say, doesn't exist anymore. But if you ever get to a big bookstore and you find Jewel Box Garden by Tom Hobbs, flip through it. It's a really nice book. Tom's a friend of mine, and I've been out there several times. But he wrapped chicken wire, just like they did at Chicago Botanic Garden with those big square things and the herbs. He wrapped chicken wire over this wall 
and put sempervivins and stuff like that in it. Left it out year-round. That's pretty. This is that dichondra again coming out of a succulent container. That is a versatile plant. Dichondra can take water with caladiums or other plants, you know, regular watering conditions, or it can survive with drought in succulent conditions. That's that Senecio I was telling you about. Does not fall apart. This is my collection. This is how I get them to not go away or get stolen, or my husband sell them. Put them in a big pot. I didn't even have to put a price tag in it. They don't even ask. <laughs> they know they can't afford it. <laughs> so, pineapples make a great thriller in the middle of a succulent container. You can use pencil cactus or something like that, but pineapples are great too. Okay, we're getting to the end. Begonias. Remember the puzzle pieces I told you about? But you collect them. I love those. I gotta have that one. And I gotta have that one. And it gets really bad. You start lining them up. Oh, I got to have that one. And then they start looking like your grandmother's collection on the shelf in the mudroom. No, add a little bit of fine foliage to it. Glues it all together. Okay, y'all know what this plant is? Uh, it's not dead. It's just, uh, yeah, a uh, mimosa pudica. Yeah, sensitive plant. We grow hundreds of them, grew hundreds of them. We didn't sell them, we gave them away. That was our ambassador plan. Had to do something with those kids. <laughs> you know, I love kids. I'm lying. <laughs> so I did this. My son was replacing his toilet, and I said to my husband, bring me the toilet. He goes, no. I said, bring me the toilet. So they brought it. I cleaned it out real good, and this guy that works for me helped me do this little thing. It's just wood, you know, standing up on end with a liner in it. He put a little 450 pump in there, and it was dribbling. I went, no. I want your worst nightmare. So we got a 1,000-gallon puddle sucker and put it on there, and it is overflowing. You know, you can, and the kids love it because they can lift the lid, and it changes the tune of the water, you know. <laughs> So this kid comes around the corner and he goes, Mom, Mom, you got to come see this. I said, yeah, you really need to come see this. And so we go around the corner and he runs up to it and she goes, no, 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 no. I said, it's clean. I promise. <laughs> she goes, no, I thought he was going to break your ornaments. I said, they're not ornaments. They're stainless steel balls. Have at it. <laughs> now look, they got their mimosa pudica. They've been playing with the toilet, throwing balls. Happy as a lark for 45 minutes so their mother could shop. I saw a cart full of plants out in front of my place. You know, I've got these big carts. I saw a, plant, a big cart full. This is my last slide anyway. But anyway, I saw this big cart full of plants and the girl said, oh, we were so busy today. Somebody just left that cart out there and forgot they even had it. They bought so much. I said, no, they didn't. That kid said, mommy, I want to go play stuff. I want to go play. Mommy, mommy, mommy. She got so sick of him whining that she just dropped the cart, grabbed him by the arm, shoved him in the truck, and she's probably not coming back. If you don't give the kids something to do or make it a kid-friendly place, you're going to suffer one way or another. So, And to add to what our introductory people were, and I'm sorry I forgot your name, but when you talked about... Um, isn't this a wonderful hobby, vocation, addiction, <laughs> illness, there we go, <laughs> that draws all kinds of people together. And if you go to my website, it's not going to be up much longer. I'm changing it from Randolph's Greenhouses to Rita's Rare Plants. You'll see my thumbs, and part of my thumb's missing. This lady comes out. She's wearing an orange leather skirt, blue top, turquoise top, bleach blonde hair, and she's got these orange fingernails. <laughs> I'm going this way. Y'all wait on her. I'll be back. A few minutes later, I look. She's got all these cool plants. She's got my fern. She's got heirloom geranium. She's got the only poinsettia I like, which is a species, variegated species. I thought, wow, you got some really cool plants. Do you need any help? She goes, oh, you're Rita. Can I? I'm, I got thumbs too. <laughs> Can you tell she's a biter? She's painting skin. Now, nothing wrong with that, 
But what I'm saying is, is just because somebody doesn't look like you, dress like you, act like you, or talk like you, doesn't mean that there isn't something we don't have in common. And isn't this wonderful? Thank you.